Hello kiddos and welcome to our last installment of our solutions unit. So today we're going to talk about preparing solutions, diluting solutions, and talking about the solubility of solutions. There's a couple of, um, there's only one math concept or one concept where we have to use a formula. The rest is just an understanding of how to do things. So we're going to look at something called volumetric techniques and standard solution is a definition you need to know. They're any solution that has a precisely known concentration. So if I know that in this bottle, right, this uh, is 1.0 moles per liter of HCl, that becomes a standard solution. It's a, still, it's a solution where I know what the concentration is. It's used in chemical analysis and to precisely control chemical reactions. Precision equipment is required. This is what's really important. We're going to have to learn about these, these uh, pieces of equipment to measure the mass of the solute in um, using an electronic balance and the volume of solution using a volumetric flask. So let's take a look at some uh, glassware. The volumetric flask is your best choice for creating a stock solution because the most precise. It's a glass flask, looks like this, kiddos. Uh, with a long narrow neck used to prepare a highly precise volume of solution and it's precise to about plus or minus 0 0.16 milliliters okay now this is what's important to know each of these fl uh, volumetric flasks the volume is one like there will be a line here for example and this would be like a hundred milliliter flask and you can only use it to measure 100 milliliters Maybe this guy here is 10 milliliter uh, volumetric flask, so it will have a little line, and only it's only used to measure exactly 10 mils. This could be a 50 milliliter volumetric flask. So a volumetric flask only has one one place where you can you can measure. A graduated cylinder is a different story. Notice how there's different gradients. Like I can measure one mil, two mils, three mils. This is a decent piece of glassware. It's a glass cylinder with regular markings used to measure a fairly precise volume of liquid or solution. So that would be your second best. An Erlenmeyer flask is a glass cone shaped flask with a large flat bottom used to mix a solution sample during titrations, markings, only approximate volume. So it's only used, they're typically used for titrations, which we'll talk about later at the end of the year, actually. A beaker, you guys know beakers. They're a glass wide body cylinder with regular markings used for transferring and storing solutions. That's all they're good for. We don't actually use them to measure. We just use them to store and to transport. So how do we do this? How do we determine the mass of a pure solid for a standard solution? Let's say I want you guys to build a 500 milliliters of 1.0 moles per liter of sodium chloride solution. How do you find the amount of um, grams in order to do that? Well, you've kind of done these questions anyways. Now, this is just a different perspective. Because you're working with one substance, you do not need a balanced equation, and there's no need for a mole ratio. Volume of the solution and smaller concentration are needed, so you need to know the volume. So here's an example. To prepare, here's our volume. Uh, 250 milliliters of 0 0.100 moles per liter, and that's my concentration. I need to know how much mass is needed for that. So the what you do is you always start with the information that only has one unit, right? And this becomes your your conversion, right? So this becomes 0 0.100 mole per liter, or one liter has 0 0.100 moles. And because I'm starting with my volume, I'm going to choose this as my conversion factor so that my liters cancel out. Okay, kiddos? And then I get my moles of uh, what I'm looking for of sodium carbonate. This is for sodium carbonate. And then I need the molar mass of the sodium carbonate so that I can cancel out my moles and then and I get my answer. So basically this is what it's, what it's telling you. I need 2.65 grams of the sodium carbonate and I put that into 250 milliliters of water to get this concentration. And it's as easy as that. So let's take a look at the procedure for preparing a standard solution. So just so you guys know, again, I'm going to repeat myself. A standard solution is a solution where you know the, the precise concentration. 
So in order to prepare one liter of a 1.0 moles per liter standard table salt solution, step number one is to convert one mole of calcium chloride into grams of calcium chloride. All right, so we know that our molar mass of sodium chloride is 58.44 grams per mole. Okay, we want to prepare one liter of a 1.0 moles per liter. Okay, so what I need to do is start with my volume, 1.0 liters. Now it's my concentration, making sure my liters are on the bottom. So 1.0 mole per liter, and that's going to get me the moles that I need, but I want the grams that I need, right? So I need to make sure that my one mole is here and my 58.44 grams is over here, my liters cancel out, my volume cancels out, my moles cancel out, and I have the amount that I need in order to make one liter of 1.0 moles per liter solution of my sodium chloride. Then my step number two is measure the required mass using an electronic balance, that makes sense. Step number three, dissolve the NaCl in 500 milliliters of water. You don't have to memorize this. This is half of the original, of the, I guess, resulting solution. So if I want to make one liter, I have to dissolve it in half. Then what I do after that is transfer the solution to a 1,000 volumetric flask. It has to be a volumetric flask, it has to be, and this matches what you're looking for because you want one liter or 1,000 milliliters. And finally, add water to the calibration line, stopper, and invert to mix. And then you just finally mix it all up. If I measured out one liter, then added the 58 grams, it would, it's going to displace, right? So you always transfer or tra dissolve your amount or your, your entity in half with water, and then you top it up with water. So here we go. Here's an example. Here's my 58.44 grams. I'm going to put that in my volumetric flask. I'm going to add about halfway of water. So in this case here, this is a 1,000 mils, right? So 500 mils. Make sure it dissolves in there. Then I'm going to top it off with water to the line. And remember, you're measuring to the bottom of the meniscus. And then there, you mix it all up, and there is my resulting solution. So what is a dilution is when I take a standard solution and I dilute it. I'm adding water to it. So dilution is decreasing the concentration of a solution, which you guys know. Uh, usually accomplished by adding more solvent. And usually our solvent of choice is water. The number of moles of solute does not change when a solution is diluted. The number of moles before is equal to the number of moles after because I'm not adding a substance to it. I'm just adding water. I'm just changing the concentration. Dilution is especially important in manipulating the concentration of solutions in chemistry for better control of reactions because sometimes I want something that's not so concentrated, so I have to learn how to dilute it. Concentrated solution reactions can be too violent to be safe and too fast to observe. A stock solution is the initial starting solution from which samples are taken for a dilution, usually very high concentrations. So here's my stock solution. So this is my original solution. And let's say it's really, really high, very, very concentrated. I take a piece of that and I add water to it. And that's going to dilute it and then I might use that for my experiment. Uh, let's take a look at preparing a standard solution by dilution. We need more cool glassware. We need, uh, let's take a look at the glassware used for dilutions. A pipette is a glass tube used to deliver very precise small amounts of solution and requires a pipette bulb to fill the pipette. So you basically a bulb goes here and we, like a turkey baster, we just suck up the amount. Here's a volumetric one where there's only one, see that little line there? It's only one reading or you can have a graduated pipette where you can, you can decide how much you want to um, use. A graduated pipette uh, marks every 1% of the volume. 10 milliliters would be marked for every 0.1 milliliter. Can transfer any volume from 1 to 100%, so you can use part of it, like you can fill it up part way or full way. And it's pretty precise. It's precise to plus or minus 0.1 milliliter. 
Your volumetric uh, pipette is the one that we would use in class. It has a bulge in the middle with one graduated marking. So basically, it's only good for one particular volume. Uh, basically, deliver to a certain volume, you transfer one specific volume, and that's it. That's all. And it's pretty precise. Determining the volume of stock solution from a standard solution. We know that the number of moles does not change when diluting a solution, but the concentration and the volume will. So we use a cool formula. C1V1 is equal to C2V2. Here's my initial concentration, my initial volume. I'm going to add extra volume to have a new concentration. Okay, kiddos? So to use the dilution formula, you must make sure the units are consistent for both the concentration and the volume. So if my V1 is in milliliters, my V2 has to be in milliliters if you're looking for one of the concentrations. Here's an example. How would you prepare 100 milliliters of uh, 0.4 moles per liter from a solution of uh, 2.0 moles per liter? So this is my C1. This is my C2, and this is my V2. So essentially what I'm looking for is I'm looking for my V1. So then I have to um, identify what I'm looking for here. And it's important to, to make a list of all your knowns and your unknown. You can either manipulate your formula or you can just al use algebra to figure it out. So I need, in order for me to dilute to this new concentration, it's a diluted concentration, I take my 20 mils, right, and I, and I pipette it into a new volumetric class, 20 milliliters. It goes into a volumetric flask that is 400 mils. This is my 100 mil volumetric flask. I take 20 mils of that, and then I, I fill the rest with water to the line, and then I have a diluted um, amount. Here's the procedure for dilution. It's a huge procedure. You don't have to memorize this. It's just so you know. So, um, oops. Standard solution, again, is a solution that I know the concentration of can also be prepared from a stock solution, the standard solution. This is done with um, dilution. When a dilution occurs, a number of moles of solute remains constant. Remember, this is me repeating myself, because you're not adding more solute. You are The number of moles of the solute stay the same. You're just adding more water. So here's the procedure. Uh, basically, you have your initial concentration. You're going to uh, take out using a pipette a certain amount. You're going to place that certain amount into your volumetric flask, right? Then what you're going to do is you're going to then add the amount of water to the specific mark, and you have a dilution. So you need a pipette, and you need a volumetric flask in order to make a, a dilution. Here's the sample dilution question number one. An ammonia solute is made, solution is made by, by diluting 100 milliliters of a concentrated commercial reagent. So if it's concentrated, it's going to be my C1. So my C1 is equal to 14.8 moles per liter until the final volume reaches. So my final volume is V2, reaches 1,000 milliliters. Uh, what is my final molar concentration? So my C2, and we started off with made by diluting 150 milliliters of a concentrated uh, solution. So my V1 is equal to 150 milliliters. Once I have all these, I just use my formula. C1V1 is equal to C2V2. And I go ahead and fill it all out to get my answer to be 2.22 moles per liter. Here's another one. In a chem uh, chemical analysis, a 25.0 milliliter sample was diluted to... Uh, 500 milliliters. So my V1 is equal to uh, my V1 25.0 milliliters. My V2 is equal to 500 milliliters. And let's continue reading. If the diluted solution has a molar concentration of this, so my C my C2 is 0 0.108 moles per liter, I'm looking for my C1. Keep in mind, kiddos, my V1 is always my lesser amount because if something has been diluted, I've added more water. Keep in mind that this is the opposite. My C1 is always the higher number because it's my concentrated amount, and then when I add water to it, my, my concentration goes down. 
How to prepare a solution by dilution? First of all, you're going to determine the amount, uh, like to determine the amount of stock solution required to prepare a wanted volume. Use my C1 V uh, C1 V1 is equal to C2 V2. And the concentration of volume have an inverse relationship, which we talked about. So as my volume increases, my concentration decreases. Step number two, prepare the pipette by rinsing it with a sample of the dilute uh, solution. Discard the rinse. Then basically you're going to transfer that amount into a volumetric flask, a specific volumetric flask. And you are going to basically add enough water to that line and you have a dilution. All right, quickly, let's talk about solubility. Solubility is the concentration of a saturated solution. A uh, solution is considered to be saturated. This is what's really important, which you kind of know. This is, this is review. When no more solute will dissolve in a solvent at a specific temperature, typically the units are weight per volume, so grams per milliliters. So maybe uh, the solubility of salt, of NaCl, is maybe 20 grams per every 100 mils. That's what that means. Since solubility is dependent on temperature, uh, a temperature value must accompany a solubility value. Usually it's at SATP, at room temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Here's an example. Uh, salt, NaCl, has an exact solubility of 4.6 grams for every 100 milliliters of water. What that means is if I add more than 4.6 grams of salt in 100 milliliters um, of water, not all of it will dissolve. Only 4.6 will dissolve in there because that's its solubility. When using solubility values, we make uh, one major assumption. The solute is not reacting with the solvent. It is only dissolving. You're only having dissolving. You're not re uh, reacting. What are some factors? There's two main factors that affect solubility. The first one is temperature. Generally, increasing the temperature of an aqueous solution will increase the solubility. However, this is not always the case. Uh, do you have the odd ones where the increase in temperature will actually decrease the solubility of a solid? The effects of temperature of solubility is different when you're dealing with gases. The effect of increasing temperature decreases the solubility of gases in aqueous uh, systems. So it's actually the opposite when you're comparing gases and solids when you're talking about solubility and temperature. Thermal pollution, this is kind of like a real, real uh, world um, situation here. Thermal pollution from industrial plants increases the temperature of a lake or river. This has an undesirable effect on aquatic life because it lowers the concentration of oxygen necessary for aquatic life. Basically, there's less dissolved um, oxygen in water that is warm. So here's an example of gases and what happens as you increase the temperature of a gas, the solubility goes down. Pressure, increasing the partial pressure of a gas over a solution will have the effect of, um, of increasing the solubility of that gas. So increased temperature increases, that increases the solubility of a, of, a, of a gas. So that's what happens with a can. When you open up the can, right, you decrease, the pressure is released and some of the gases then are released because they're not as soluble because you've decreased the, the pressure. Miscibility is a cool word just mean, that just means liquids dissolve in liquids. So let's take a look. Polar uh, liquids have a higher solubility at higher temperatures. These liquids are known as miscible. So a polar liquid will dissolve in water because water is polar. Liquids containing small polar molecules with hydrogen bonds dissolve completely in water regardless of the quantity mixed. So it doesn't matter how much of the liquid that is polar I can add to water, it's always going to dissolve. For example, ethanol will dissolve in water in any proportion with no maximum concentration. Liquids that are insoluble in each other are said to be immiscible. So that's just a, def that's just a definition, which means oil and water, they don't mix because one's polar and one's nonpolar. So let's summarize, shall we? Now let's take a look at temperature and pressure. For temperature, for solids, uh, increasing temperature will increase the solubility. For liquids, Eh, not much of an effect. For gases, it's the opposite, right? We want a, a inc an increase in temperature will decrease the solubility. So solubility of a gas decreases when the temperature increases. So for pressure, pressure has little change on the solid when you're dissolving a solid in a liquid. Pressure changes has very little effect. Pressure changes have very little effect on the solubility of a liquid with a liquid. However, the solubility of a gas increases when the pressure increases. 
Just a couple more things and we are done. A saturated solution is the concentration of the dissolved solute is constant. There's no change in observable properties. As a result, we say that it's going through dynamic equilibrium. So when something's saturated, we're saying that it's going through dynamic e equilibrium. This means that there's an equal amount of solute solution crystallizing as there is dissolving. So the amount of dissolving and recrystallizing is exactly the same. It's happening at the same time and at the same rate, and we call that saturated. And any extra you add of solute, and it's going to crystallize. This is the exact, exact time where everything is, is, is equal. So let's just explain it a little further. In a saturated solution, solute is constantly dissolving and recrystallizing, and that's where this double arrow comes from. This double arrow means it's going this way, creating I2, and it's going this way, creating I2 solid and I, um, I2 aqueous, and it's exactly the same. These two processes occur at the same time, and again, we're ca it's called dynamic equilibrium. The number of particles dissolving is equal to the number of particles crystallizing. So it's said to you a few different times. So I think we got it. It's in the vault. Here's some examples. Solid calcium sulfate is added to water in a large enough quantity that not all will dissolve. So it's saturated. It's exactly the same. So here, we can write these in two different ways. They mean the same thing. Two solutions containing a very high concentration of calcium and sulfate ions, respectively, are mixed. So I can either talk about that this is dissolving or that this is crystallizing, but because of these double arrows, the crystallizing and the dissolving are happening at the same time and at the same rate. It doesn't matter which way we express these equations, they're both at e uh, dynamic equilibrium. And what is the difference between saturated and an unsaturated? An un a saturated solution contains the maximum we know this already, we talked about this, amount of solute for a given volume of a solvent at a constant temperature. Unsaturated solution, on the other hand, contains less solute, okay, which means I can add more than a saturated solution. And uh, here's an example of unsaturated, this is saturated. Now this saturation changes, it depends on the, uh, what solute you're talking about. Each solute has its own saturation when it comes to dissolving in water. Something supersaturated solution is also possible. A supersaturated solution contains more solute than it theoretically should hold. This only happens, kiddos, actually is when you heat things up, okay? Uh, this is possible when a seed crystal, a crystal of a solute is added to a supersaturated solution, allowing the excess solute to dissolve. So if I take sugar and water, and I let's say that um, the solubility of sugar in water is, let's say, 50 grams in 100 mils. If I heat up that water, I can actually add more sugar and it will dissolve. Then we've created a supersaturated solution. The moment, so this, if this is my supersaturated solution, the moment I add just one little bit of sugar, all of a sudden it recrystallizes. And that's how you get that crystal, those crystal suckers that look like crystals. Okay, that's it, kiddos. Have a great day.